So this morning, um, I'm going to divide the crowd for a second with, uh, I know it's all about unity, not division, but we're going we're gonna to be divisive just for a second. I, I know every time I preach, I always like, I'm just going to be calm. <laughs> I can't. So they were like, hey, are you wearing a head mic? No, I can't. I run too much and that thing falls down. And so I'm going to ask you guys a question. How many of you live by a paper calendar? Come on, raise your hand. You have an old school. Hey, Jesse, can we turn the lights up? The house lights, turn them up. No, raise your, raise your hand. Raise it. Be proud of that paper calendar. I am married to a paper calendar girl. All right, there we go, and all the people. All right, how many of you are straight digital? Like straight digital. Alexa's your best friend, Siri. Come on, keep them high. I want to see this. Now, how many of you are a hybrid? You got both. See, we're balanced. See, all y'all are, are too extreme. We're balanced. We're balanced people. But we live in a generation where Alexa and Hey Google and Siri have become personal assistants of ours. So if you're watching on live stream right now, I want you to put in the comments what you use. So camera one, I'm looking at you. Put in what you use. If you put, I'm a paper digital hybrid, and then start a little argument on um, YouTube for me. It's just joking. But anywhere we go, anytime I'm like, hey, Kayla, we're going to do this Friday night, she like, boom, 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 pulls out her paper calendar. And she's like, I'm not scheduled. I don't have anything until next Thursday. It's like, oh, thank you. So paper calendars work. I'm actually a hybrid. I have a paper calendar. I have a digital calendar. But here's what I love about digital calendars is the reminders. See, your, your paper calendar doesn't scream at you. Hey, you got a meeting at noon. But a digital calendar does. And so today the message is going to be reminders. And let me be honest with you where this thing came from. So I live by a set of reminders. And I didn't even know I did this until I was talking to somebody a couple months ago. And I was talking to some of my friends a couple weeks ago. And they said, Brady, you kind of live by these values, like these reminders that you have. And I said, I kind of do. And they said, what's your first one? And I spouted something out. And they're like, what about number two? And I spouted something out. And I was like, oh my gosh, I do. And so I started writing these down. And so when Pastor Jordy's like, hey, can you preach on August 2nd? I said, sure, I'm going to preach on reminders. And so that's what this has to do with. So even in my business, I have a business on the side. I, I film commercials and everything anybody asked me to film. Not everything, that's weird. But um, <laughs> let me... <laughs> Mic drop. Hey, I'll see you in six months, guys. Um, and so I film things. And so I have reminders, like whenever a client contacts me, hey, can you film this? Well, a week before whatever that project is, a reminder pops up on my calendar. It says, hey, contact the client, ask this. And then the day before, it says, do this. And so I set up these processes. And so I love reminders. And so that's what this has to do with. And here's why reminders are important to me. So if you have your Bible, I'm going to, all the Kidmo students, you got a little paper. There's not notes in there because I want you to take notes. Even adults, take notes. I am going to do something completely opposite of what I normally like to do. When I preach, normally I like to have one passage of scripture. And I like to just to hammer on that passage over and over. Today, I have a lot of scriptures, so you might not be able to turn to all of them. They're going to be on the screen, but please take notes. And I have a lot of reminders, but I promise you, I'm not going to keep you long and I'm not going to get through all of them. And so probably what I'll do is I'll record a podcast for like part two of this because Pastor Jody said I can't preach more than one week. So that's a joke. All right, Joshua chapter one. We're going to read that. Let's pray before we read. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word gives light to our life and it directs our past, Lord. So we read this word. Lord, give us fresh revelation from your word this morning. Give us some rhema, some fresh revelation from on high in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Joshua 1, chapter six, uh, Joshua 1, verse 6 through 8. We're going to read this in just a second. This is why I believe reminders in our life are so important. I learned this, the first time I heard this scripture, I think I was 15 years old. I was at a, um, like a Bible rodeo camp, and the guy preaching said, as a young person, he said, I believe we are a Joshua generation. And it hit me. I'm like, okay, let me read the book of Joshua. So I read the book of Joshua. And then I actually just read the book of Joshua last month. Like I said, I'm just going to take the whole and I'm just going to read Joshua slowly. And I really believe we are in a Joshua generation. So if you're a young person watching online or you're in here, listen to this. Because I believe this applies to us today as a Joshua generation. Even if you're 80 years old, it still applies to you. All right. It says this in verse 6. Be strong and courageous for you are the one who will lead these people to possess 
all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instruction Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Verse 8, here we go. Study this book of instruction continually. Study. Don't just read. Study this book continually. Meditate on it. Day and night, so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all that you do. Read this book of instruction. Study this book of instruction. Meditate on it day and night. And so whenever I read the Bible, and again, I apologize if I'm talking to you as a, like an elementary school teacher, but I was shocked when Pastor Jody took over um, three and a half years ago, we did a survey for our church. We actually want to do another one. And so here's an, another divisive comment. If I was, and we're not going to do this because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But if we were to ask you right now, how many times a month do you read your word? How many times a week do you read your word? It's not very popular. In fact, when we did the survey three and a half years ago, we were shocked at the comments. We were shocked. Now we know um, whenever you look at national statistics that only, only like, 5% of believers read their Bible daily and only like 10% read their Bible weekly. Listen, if we're supposed to be Christ-like and do everything that Jesus commanded us to do, you got to know what he commanded you to do. The problem is we're living off of somebody else's scraps on a Sunday morning and we're like, oh, we heard the word and then we don't even read it for ourselves. If we want to prosper and be successful in everything we do, as including being Christ-like and a witness to him, and for him on this world, being partnered with the Holy Spirit, we got to know what he says to do. We got to meditate on it. And so these are where these reminders come from. So I have these statements. I go, I got to remind myself this. And I'm going to be honest with you. Most of them are completely opposite from my natural personality. And so here we go. Are y'all ready for the reminders? Reminders is this. Number one, live simple. I don't know if y'all noticed back on March 14th when the world shut down, did you realize how busy you were? I had a friend that contacted me that said, I, I don't know if I want to go back to the old life. And I said, what do you mean? He said, man, we got this practice. We got this practice. We got this. We got this. He said, we were never home to even eat family dinner together. And he said, now I come home from work. We play in the yard. We cook supper together. We eat together. We play a board game together. And then we go to bed and we do the same thing the next day. I'm getting so much time with my family. I don't know if I want to go back to the busy schedule. And we found the same thing. We were in, right when the shutdown happened, we were in wrestling practice twice a week. We were in tournament baseball practice three times a week. And it's just like, bam, bam, bam. I didn't realize how chaotic my life was getting until that happened. And so this, this reminder, live simple, is huge to me. There's a scripture I want you to turn to because I want you to underline in your Bible, which means you have to have a paper Bible to do that. Or you can highlight it on the digital copy and send a reminder to yourself, which is really cool. <laughs> Micah chapter 6, verse 8. This is a scripture that I have to, like you can ask the staff. In staff meeting, any time things get complicated, we're like, hey, what are we doing for small groups? What are we doing for flourish? I'm like, Micah 6, 8. I just say it over and over. And this is what it says. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. So this is what the Lord requires of us right here. To do what is right. Can we just stop right there? Do what is right. Don't cheat your neighbor. Do what is right. Don't make bad business deals. Do what is right. To love mercy. Mercy un unfavored, unattainable grace, all that love, mercy. You know why? Because the Lord was merciful to us. So we are to love mercy. And the last one, and to walk humbly with your God. So when life gets complicated, a reminder I have to remind myself is to live simple. In Proverbs, it talks about be a simpleton, like live simple. What does the Lord require of me? To do what is right, to love mercy. Because if I love mercy, I'll give mercy. And to walk humbly before the Lord. And that word walk, what does it mean to walk? You know, in, in Amos it says, can two um, walk together unless they agree to do so? So when you say, I'm going to walk with the Lord, the Lord desires a slow, steady, walking relationship with us. An intimate relationship. It goes back to Genesis when he used to walk with Adam in the garden. 
That's what he desires of us, to walk humbly. It didn't say to run. You know, Jesus never ran anywhere. It says he walked. Even whenever, like if I was Jesus, I said this uh, to the staff a, a while back. If I was Jesus, I would have a horse. You know, and when he did decide to ride an animal, if anybody ever rode a donkey, we, and at Self Friday, they used to play donkey basketball. How many, uh, how many of the people remember donkey basketball at Self Friday? Ah, did you play? Did you, did you play? You, did you play donkey basketball? Did you get bucked off? Yes, awesome. I remember being a little kid going to watch donkey basketball where they put donkeys in the gym and you ride them and you play basketball. It was crazy. And people getting bucked off wearing helmets. It was fun. Did they even wear helmets back then? I don't know. It's like not wearing a seatbelt in the car now. And so I truly believe the Lord has called us to live a simple life. And he didn't, and he, we got to follow his example. He didn't run anywhere. He walked. You know how I know he didn't run anywhere? Because it said people always caught up with him. If he was running like we do, who got to get to the next place. People couldn't catch him. The woman with the issue of blood touched his garment. Why? Because he was walking slow through the crowd. Slow down, live simple. And I have one more verse I want to go with this. I feel like I'm back to like high school preaching. Like when I used to preach in high school, like just tons of scriptures. I love the Bible. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 11. I'm going to step on some toes. I'm going to go Pastor Jody on you for a second. Get ready, because here it comes. Make it your goal to live a quiet life. woo Make it your goal to live a quiet life. Minding your own business. Oh, if we live by that. Oh, my gosh. Okay, sorry. I got to go on because I'm about to. All right. Minding your own business. Working with your hands. And all the cowboys say Amen. Just as we instructed you before, then people who are not Christians will respect the way you live. As of right now, the most divisive place you can be is on social media. And I, I'm, I'm not, like, I know Pastor Jody a couple weeks ago said, you know, he's not on social media. He hates it. I'm actually on social media. Now, don't look at my post because I haven't posted anything for like six months, but I'm on social media because I do want to know what people are talking about and try to stay relevant and cultural and see what's going on in the world. Again, I don't get my news from social media or memes, but I really believe social media can be a good thing and a terrible thing at the same time. And here's where I believe it's hurting us. As Christians, we are supposed to be known for Jesus we're supposed to be known for loving mercy, walking humbly for the Lord. But you know what we're known for? Is more, we're known more for what we're against than what we stand for. We are known as the body of Christ for what we're against. We're against these people, these people. Oh, no, we're not against people. We're against principalities. But we're so judgmental against people. And he says right here, Paul, mind your own business. Mind your own business. Who cares what your neighbor's doing? In fact, you know, even in 1 Corinthians, it talks about, um, this is an awesome verse. It says that if anybody is in sexual sin, don't even eat lunch with them if they're in the body of Christ. Think about that for a moment. Now, we like to take that scripture and go, oh, I can't, I can't associate with the world because they're in sin. Paul even says, I'm not talking about those who are in the, I'm talking about those in the body. Because those outside the body, we have no right to talk about because they don't know the loving Jesus that we know. And he says that if a brother or sister, a fellow believer is in sexual sin, don't even eat with them. But if a worldly person's in sexual sin, go and reach them. That's why in Luke chapter 6, it talked about Jesus was accused of being a drunkard because he ate and he drank with tax collectors and sinners. And when when the religious people went up to him and said, what are you doing? You know what Jesus said? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. But we're so busy fighting each other that we don't have respect from the world. People listen to you when they respect you. If you don't know that, read Dale Carnegie. Great leadership book that I love reading. I love teaching about. I teach a leadership class at a middle school, and I love teaching about Dale Carnegie. People don't care what you have to say until they know how much you care. And we should be known by our fruit of love. Because if anybody can love this world, it needs to be us. We need to be the lovers. We need to be the dealers of hope, the dealers of love. It should be us. In this pandemic and all this stuff that's going on in the world, people should be flocking to us. 
But you know what they see when they see us? Complainers, conspiracy theorists. The world's going to hell in a handbasket and don't know what to do. I don't know if you ever read the Bible, but read the end of the book. It's, I mean, it's, it's in there. Now, do we believe it or not believe it? it? It gets a little darker, but you know what? The light shines bright in the darkness. Mind your own business, work with your hands, and then the people who are not Christians, will, they will respect the way you live and will not need to depend on others. Lord, I want to live a quiet life. I want to live a simple life. Live simple. Number two, my second reminder is this. And I've kind of already said it over and over and over. And I say it every time I preach and people are like, you need to get off of it, but I can't. The word is vital. The word is vital. It is our fuel. It is our bread. It is everything. And I'm not talking about a preacher like myself right now regurgitating the word. You can have a personal relationship with the word and you don't need somebody. I thank God for preaching. I thank God for ministers of the gospel. But you know what? I'm so glad that we have the ability to go to approach the throne room with boldness. And we get to go before our father and say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying right here? And we can have revelation that he can give us in this word. I love the Bible. I love how the Bible is personal. I love the Bible. The word is vital. It's our fuel. It's our meat. It's how we live. How many of us read our Bible though? How many of us study our Bible? I can't get out of Luke chapter six. Like I've been reading Luke 6 for like three weeks. One of the verses in Luke 6, can, like it convicts me so hard. Give to those who can't repay you. Oh, oh my gosh. Give to those who can't repay you. What if I went up to you and says, hey, I need, I need like $10,000. Josh, I need 10 grand. First question would be like, okay, number one, well, do I have 10,000 to give you? And number two, when am I going to get my money back? And hey, I'll give it to you, but I need 10% interest. And Jesus said, do the complete opposite. Pray for your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. It's so opposite from the way we live. But when you read the word, what happens, it becomes a mirror. And I see myself and something happens. And, and then I start becoming like that word. That's why we walk with the Lord. Because when two walk together, they start thinking a lot alike. You start talking alike. That's why California has a whole nother cultural lingo. I watched the 1980s movie Rad the other night. Y'all remember Rad? Yeah, 1986. I watched it, number one, it was rated PG. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'll watch it. Oh my gosh, I forgot 1986. PG means something else in 1986 than it does today. And I watched it in the lingo, oh, that's so rad. Like, it's cultural. And so when you hang out with people, you start talking like each other. And so I want to talk like the Lord. I want to think like the Lord. In order to do that, I got to spend time in the word. And so I read a, um, I, my Briggs, he wanted a new Bible. So we got him a teen Bible. And he's like, dad, where do I start reading? And look, I'm so grateful that my kid can quote verses because of school. Like they have memory verses and all that. But I want my, word, I want my son to read context. I wanted to read the word. So I said, dude, and I'll tell this to anybody. If you're, if you're convicted by not reading the Bible, read John. Read the book of John. Forget everything else and just read the book of John because it, it lays out Jesus' life so perfect. And this is what we did. I said, Briggs, let's read John 1. And I said, and we broke it down. Let's just break it down. You have any questions? What is this? And I think he got through like three words and I'm like, all right, stop. What does that mean? Then he got through like six words. Stop. What does that mean? So I want him to learn. I don't want him just to memorize things. I don't want to create a church kid. I want him to have a relationship with the Lord. I want him to have an encounter with the Lord. Not each, I don't want him to know it here. I want him to know it here. And guess what? I can't do it for him. I can't. As much as we try to brainwash our kids, brainwashing our kids does not make them go to heaven. Brainwash kids doesn't make them be a witness to the world. They got to have it here. Got to have an encounter. And so I want to read what I read to Briggs the other day. And again, I'm going to treat you like you never read this. And Lord, open up people's eyes for the first time. Here we go. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, the word, look at the word right there. It's capitalized. It's capitalized. And I said, Briggs, what does that mean? It's a person. I'm like, exactly. All right. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. God created everything through him, him being the word, 
and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created in his life. The word's life brought light. Everybody say light. If you're online, type in light. Light, light. It brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. The light shines in the darkness. So I don't care how dark the world gets, guess what? We're the flashlight, let's turn on the freaking light. All right, and then listen to this. Go to verse 14, this is where it gets really cool. So that same word, so the word became human. So the word already existed. Everything was created. So when God said, let there be light, guess what? It was the word. The word created the light. So the word became human and made his home among us. And I'm going to add something right here. Oh, Lord, please forgive me for adding to the word. He didn't just make his home among us. Now he made his home in us. He made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Verse 14 explains it was Jesus. Jesus is the light. And the darkness cannot extinguish it. But do we believe it? Do we live that? If we did, I believe most of us would maybe turn off the TV and read the word. And I'm not talking about in times of trouble. I'm talking about daily bread. I need this word. I don't need it to preach a good message. I don't need it to raise my kids well. I need it for me. I need it to live. This is my guiding light. I need this word. And then you take the word and mix it with the Holy Spirit. Then you got a grand slam out of the park. I got one more scripture I want to read about this. And just write down, I don't want you to have to turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This is why it's important to know the word. So Timothy is a young minister. Paul wrote this to Timothy because he was a young minister and he was having a church. And so I believe all of us are ministers of the gospel. As soon as you say yes to Jesus, how many, have, how many said yes to the Lord? You're saved. Come on, raise your hand. All right, guess what? Congratulations. Get off the bench and start doing the work of the ministry because you are a minister of the gospel. So in, in, in 2 Timothy 2.15, this is what Paul told Timothy. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. The King James Version says, rightly divide the word of truth. In order to explain the word of truth, I got to know the word of truth. I remember back in the day, we used to have John 3.16 written all over our cars. Y'all remember that? We had John 3.6 st stickers at Victory, and everybody got one. It's like, you became a member, you got two stickers. Yes, Lord, we will ride. Y'all remember? <laughs> remember that? Okay. We will ride with you. Sorry, I won't sing. See, I was better at 17. Um, but... We had two, we had a bumper sticker, Yes, Lord. It was a song from Brownsville Revival, Yes, Lord, we will ride with you. And then we had John 3, 16. I'll never forget how many people would ask some people, hey, what is John, like we had a gas station. Hey, what's John 3, 16? Uh, 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 God, he, he gave Jesus. <laughs> it's like, wow. And I remember me and my buddy were driving and not, we were not driving slow, let me say it like that. And we got pulled over. And, um, <laughs> and the cop was like, if you have John 3.16, you might want to slow down on the back of your car. And he's like, what does it mean? And I was like, and I froze. Um, and it was like, I got to know the word of truth. I need to know the word. I got to be able to quote the word. And the reason why is because there is deception all around us. There is deception, and that's the enemy's number one tool, is to deceive Christians. And, he, and it says this, that the devil, the enemy, masquerades as an angel of light an angel of light, so he comes looking like light. But we gotta know the word. And I know we can do, do the church cheesy thing, like, hey, how did Jesus defeat Satan? As it is written, he quoted the word, and that is true. He quoted the word. We gotta know the word. In Hebrews 4.12, it says this. We're not gonna turn that. In Hebrews 4.12, it says the word is a it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it cuts, and that's what it also says. It shows the desires of the man's heart. 
It reveals the desires of my heart. So when I read the word, it reveals what's in my heart. And we know from the word that what's in man's heart is not always good. In fact, it's evil. So I need the word to cleanse me. It washes me. And this is my last point, and we'll close. My third reminder is this. Be the light. So I, I have to remind myself daily, Brady, live simple. Live simple. Live simple. Walk humbly before the Lord. Do what is right. Love mercy. Second one is I got to remember that the word is vital. I need a reminder. The word is vital. And the third is be the light. Be the light. One that I think is the greatest three chapters in the Bible is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I believe that the, the, that passage of Scripture where Jesus is on the Sermon on the Mount and he is blasting people. He goes through the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know, and all, uh, blessed are those who are pure heart for they shall see God. He goes through that whole thing. But then he flips the script. And in Matthew 5, verse 14 through 16, he says this, you are the light of the world. Now let's remember what happened in John 1. It says that he is the light. And the light, when it shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot distinguish it. And then in 514, it says, now you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Does anyone light a lampstand and put it under a table so no one can hit it? No, they put it on the, lamp, on the table so it gives light to everyone. And in my, Matthew 516 says, let your light shine so before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The problem is, most of us, we use our voice for things that's not shedding the light. We use our words as device. It, 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 divide, it divides people. It's divisive. Let's use our words to do what Jesus said. You are the light of the world. You. So I have to tell myself, I am the light of the world. And it sounds so like arrogant. I'm the light of the world. But you are. If Christ lives in you and the Holy Spirit is in there, guess what? You are the light of the world. So wake up every morning and get out of bed and say, I'm the light. Now you got two choices. If you haven't been reading the word, your batteries are dead. We need our batteries to be in our flashlights so we can shine bright because the world is getting darker. If we were to turn out all the lights and I, and I shined a single light, it would be bright. See, right now, the reason why it's not too bright in here is, you know why? We're all a bunch of flashlights. There's no darkness. We're all flashlights right now. You know where a flashlight is needed? In the dark. So you know what we're supposed to do? Be the light of the world. Walk humbly before the Lord, with the Lord, going into the world, and being the light to the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Be the light.